will be at this moment that Joe McCarthy, a unknown senator from Wisconsin in his first term, will accidentally kind of find his opportunity to become a star. In February of 1950 in Wheeling, West Virginia, uh, uh, McCarthy goes to give a speech to a group of farmers. And at this meeting, he takes out a sheaf, sheet of what we now know are, are blank papers, and he waves them uh, up in the air, and he says that, that these papers contain the, a list of 205 known communists in the State Department. He's completely making it up. He's just wanting to get on, on the commie hunting game for political gain. Uh, he also, by the way, uh, uh, lies about serving in combat in World War II. He had served, but he wasn't a, a, in combat. He gains national attention with this, with this uh, claim of all these communists. And so he doubles down again and again and again, claiming, more, giving more and more spectacular claims, totally evidence-free, of knowledge of plots within the United States government uh, by the communists. And he will eclipse Nixon and become the leader of the Red Scare. When the Republicans regain the Senate in 1952, they give McCarthy his own subcommittee so he can launch his own highly publicized witch hunts of whoever he feels like it because he's not bound by having to have evidence or anything. <clears throat> McCarthy relentlessly bullies innocent witnesses, and he becomes the darling of the anti-communist. When the Republican Party runs in the congressional elections of 1954, uh, they adopt his slogan, 20 years of treason. I'm sorry, and when they run in 1952, when Eisenhower runs in 1952, they adopt McCarthy's slogan, 20 years of treason, referring to the five terms of, of FDR and Truman. Eisenhower actually hated him, but he was scared to speak out against him, fearing it would cost him critical support in the Republican Party. And in the 1952 election, this was kind of the Republicans' only issue. They didn't really put forth any sort of comprehensive economic or foreign policy programs. They just stood around and screamed that the Democrats were a bunch of communists. And, of course, it worked. The stalemate in Korea, the fear of communist plot, made 1952 a Republican year. Truman knows he can't win, and he just decides not to run. The Democrats nominate uh, uh, Adlai Stevenson, the governor of Illinois. He's witty and elegant. He's an intellectual. And this makes him a target of the new anti-intellectual Republican Party, who basically says being intelligent and well-educated are hallmarks of a communist, so Stevenson, probably a communist. They called him weak and soft on commies, pink as they called it. The conservatives first try to nominate Robert Taft or Douglas MacArthur. Uh, Douglas MacArthur will say when he retires from military service that old soldiers don't die, they just fade away. But that wasn't really true at all. MacArthur didn't fade away. He was all over the place making speeches about the communist menace in our government. He was one of the great Red Scare uh, uh, Red Baiters. And he had become the darling of that wing of the Republican Party. Taft was the, the, the uh, hero of the more moderate wing of the Republican Party, but neither one of them were able to get uh, uh, majority support in the party. And so they turned to Dwight Eisenhower, who had been non-political for most of his life, um, and, and, and uh, accepts the nomination not so much as a politician, but kind of as a beloved war hero. To bolster his weak anti-communist credentials, um, he had worked with the Soviets in the war, after all, uh, Ike needs somebody who's going to make it clear that he's an ardent anti-communist cold warrior uh, like the rest of the Republican Party. And so he chooses Richard Nixon as his vice presidential candidate. Nixon was one of the most high-profile uh, 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 Red Scare politicians. Eisenhower is likable, and he makes promises of peace and victory in Korea. I for president, I for president, I for president, I for president. You like Ike, I like Ike, everybody likes Ike. For president, hang out the banner, beat the drum. We'll take Ike to Washington. We don't want John or, or Harry. Let's do that big job right. Will attack Richard Nixon 
for taking bribes. They say that he has been paid off time and again by corporations and, and interest groups. And Nixon will go on TV fighting for his political life, and he'll deliver uh, a 30-minute speech, or about there, um, which he will conclude with these very famous remarks about one particular gift he got uh, from a lobbyist. One other thing I probably should tell you, because if I don't, they'll probably be saying this about me, too. We did get something, a gift, after the election. A man down in Texas heard Pat in the radio mention the fact that our two youngsters would like to have a dog. And believe it or not, the day before we left on this campaign trip, we got a message from the Union Station in Baltimore saying they had a package for us. We went down to get it. You know what it was? It was a little Cocker Spaniel dog in a crate that he'd sent all the way from Texas. Black and white, spotted. And our little girl, Tricia, the six-year-old, named it Chuck. And you know, the kids, like all kids, love the dog. And I just want to say this right now, that regardless of what they say about it, we're going to keep it. But just let me say this last word. Regardless of what happens, I'm going to continue this fight. I'm going to campaign up and down in America until we drive the crooks and the communists and those that defend them out of Washington. And remember, folks, Eisenhower is a great man, believe me. He's a great man. And a vote for Eisenhower is a vote for what's good for America. The checker speech saves Nixon's career, and he lives to fight another day. And the Republicans essentially uh, uh, use Nixon to go around and call the Democrats cowards and communist appeasers, say they're soft on communism. And it works. And in 1952, uh, Eisenhower wins a dramatic and crushing victory, um, and the Republicans take both houses. Notice it is only that still loyal, racist, Dixiecrat South that remains with the Democratic Party in 1952, and not even all of that.